Hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Anne Kruijt and I'm the host for today's talk. If you are participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation. And then we have time to address these questions after the presentation is complete. Today's speaker is Richard Griscom. Richard is a postdoc at Leiden University Center for Linguistics. He specializes in the documentation of endangered languages and functional typological linguistic description with emphasis on the languages of East Africa and the development of digital fieldwork methods. He's currently focusing on the documentation of Hatsa, a language isolated of Northern uh, Tanzania. Please join me in welcoming Richard as he gives his talk. Our tongues are rare, the mysterious Dorobo language known as Omayo. Thank you for the introduction, Anna, and thanks to everyone who's participating today. I hope everyone is doing well and staying safe. So today we're going to talk about a so-called Dorobo language. The existence of a group of people in East Africa called Dorobo was first reported in the mid 19th century by European missionaries and colonialists. For many years, it was assumed that there was a single group of people called Dorobo and that they constituted some of the original inhabitants of East Africa before the arrival of Cushitic, Bantu, and Nilotic ethnic groups. Eventually, it became apparent that the name Dorobo was simply a term given by the Maasai to describe any small hunter-gatherer community. It was also clear that there are not necessarily any connections between different Dorobo groups, and that at least some of the Dorobo groups actually have their origins in Cushitic or Nilotic communities. Some scholars went as far as to say that there were no actual Dorobo ethnic groups, that they were simply farmers and herders who had resorted to hunting and gathering due to adverse environmental or economic conditions. Regardless of how you conceive of them, the communities referred to as Dorobo are captivating for a number of reasons. Their relationships with larger communities like the Maasai, Kikuyu, and Kalenjin can inform our understanding of how hunter-gatherers may have co-resided with newly arriving pastoralists and agriculturalists in the past. They also provide striking test cases of ethnogenesis and ethno-extinction. These small and quickly disappearing speech communities provide a window into the past and the linguistic history of the region but not necessarily in the way that European missionaries initially thought. Rather than representing the so-called original hunter-gatherer communities of the region, they tell us more about the fluidity of ethnicity and subsistence strategies, and they call into question our assumptions about the cultural continuity among Cushitic, Nilotic, and Bantu groups. Today, I'm going to present data on a language which is known to linguists by the name Omayo and which thus far has not successfully been classified. Although I'd like to be able to give you an analysis that results in a quick classification, what I will be giving you in fact is something much more complex and problematic. So the Omayo language, as I said, is an uh, unclassified language, it is also a moribund language. It's spoken by only three semi-speakers as of 2018, and all of the members of this community have more or less assimilated into the local Maasai community. You can see the location of the Omayo community in this map on the right. You can also see a picture of the three speakers, each with a green arrow above their heads, uh, together with a local chairman, Dowdy Peterson, and Alina Redka. So the Amayo, uh, according to interviews with the speakers, were formerly hunter-gatherers, and they lived in uh, the area of the Serengeti National Park. They were expelled from that area in the 1950s, at the same time as the Maasai, and they are now living in this area that I described, which is between the Ngorongor Conservation Area and the Maswa Game Reserve, near a village called Macau. According to some interviews with speakers, they possibly interacted with the Hadza in the, in the past, uh, but it's not necessarily uh, true that that took place. There's just a, a couple of statements about that. The data that was collected with the speakers uh, was collected over five different occasions from 2012 to 2018. So it's a six year period with five different data collection sessions. 
The first of these sessions was in 2012, and this was Dowdy Peterson by himself, uh, working with two male speakers. He created transcriptions, did not uh, create a recording, and he sent those transcriptions around to linguists. So that was the first time that linguists heard about this language. In 2014, Dowdy returned together with two others, and all three of them made transcriptions. They also created a recording using an iPhone. Later, Bonnie Sands, an RVN colleague of ours, later created transcriptions based on those iPhone recordings. These recordings were also made with two male speakers together with a third female speaker. In 2017, Carson Lugier sent a Tanzanian colleague of his to work with the Omaya speakers and he created some transcriptions. In 2018, Dowdy Peterson returned to work with the Omaya again. He invited them to the Mwibo Lodge and he created transcriptions together with two others again. Paolo Parana and Elena Redka of the Mwibo Lodge. They worked with the same three speakers again. They did not create a recording. Later in 2018, uh, I went to Macau together with two colleagues of mine from the Asim Jig Toga community, and we created four recordings within a single day. The first recording was with the two male speakers. They were just giving some uh, metadata about themselves, and they produced a few words. The second recording was just with the female speaker. She provided some words and then also her own speaker metadata. And then the last two recordings were primarily of the, the female speaker, uh, who sometimes was aided by the other two male speakers. So as I said, there are only three remaining speakers and all three of them are quite old. They have trouble remembering words and they don't speak very much Swahili. So we had to use the local chairman, who here's pictured on the left, as a translator from Swahili to Ma. When I went to work with them, we were also restricted by time because the local chairman did not want us to work with the speakers if he was not present. And he already had made plans to depart the next day. So we had one day to work with them. Also, the female speaker was not present at the beginning and we had to request that she come by motorcycle. By the time that she arrived in the evening, she was already somewhat tired and we only had two or three hours to work with her. So now we'll start to take a look at uh, some descriptive statistics of all the data compiled together from all five sources. Altogether, there are approximately 367 unique form meaning pairs with some repetitions in forms or in meanings. Uh, in terms of part of speech of the English translations, which were used to elicit items, you can see there's a heavy skewing towards nouns uh, with some elicitation of verbs. All of the data that has been collected with the Omayo speakers is now hosted in a project on the Open Science Framework. This is a project that I put together recently you can access this project with the URL that you see on your screen. And in fact, I will share that URL in the chat right now. So you're welcome to visit that site at your leisure. On this website, uh, as I said, all of the data is included together. The machine readable text data is linked from GitHub and the, the other resources are linked from Dropbox. But you can, you can look at all that data together, and there's also a small wiki page. I created EAF files of my own recordings, so you can use those with Alon, as you see here. And I also created text grid files for use with Prot, so you can do phonetic analysis. Finally, I also created uh, CSV files, so comma separated value files. Uh, these are useful because they're really easy to access. There's even a, a CSV reader built into OSF. So if you go to that OSF page, you can look at the, uh, the CSV files right away just using that website. So I want to speak briefly to the issue of the reliability of data. Campbell in 2014 published uh, an article about 
uh, common features of so-called fake languages. So he had been working in Mexico and on a number of occasions, he had employed someone to, to uh, produce items of what he thought was a, a novel language or an undocumented language. And it turned out that that language was just being made up by the speaker. So in his list of common features includes things as those that we see on the screen now. So these are features not only of the linguistic data, such as the phonetics and the phonology, but then also behavior of the speaker during the elicitation session. So in terms of the linguistic data, uh, we definitely see oftentimes the phonetics of the phonology will reflect the repertoire of the speaker. So in Campbell's case, if they were a speaker of Spanish, they might utilize Spanish phonology or they might even use uh, Spanish words. Uh, we also, or Campbell also found that speakers would not be able to easily recall words that they had previously produced. They would continue to struggle more and more as the elicitation session would go on and they would never offer any unrequested words. They might also offer the same word for a different meaning and they would never be able to produce complex phrases or full clauses and they couldn't produce any clearly systematic morphology. When we look at the Omayo data, you'll see that this is actually true for a lot of the Omayo speakers and, and the data that they produced. Now, what I would like to propose is that this binary distinction between so-called fake languages and so-called real languages is a little bit too simplistic and that the Omayo data is actually somewhere in between. And in fact, some of the Omayo data is perhaps more reliable than some of the other data. And I want to show you how we might be able to distinguish between those different types of data. There are also various reasons for data being unre unreliable or reliable. Reasons for the data being unreliable, as I said, include issues like uh, language attrition. So the fact that the speakers are old, uh, it's hard for them to remember words or phrases. There's the translation issue. So we're going essentially from English to Swahili to Ma to Omayo. There are also transcription issues because most of the transcriptions in the data were not created by trained linguists. And also we can say that there wasn't very much overlap between the goals or interests of the speakers we're working with and our own interests as data collectors. So the speakers had less incentive to be uh, cooperative or helpful during the sessions. There are some reasons, however, for saying that the data could be more reliable. So one of those is uh, that there are three speakers rather than just one. So it's uh, much less plausible that three speakers co-created a fake language rather than saying that one speaker made it up. There are also some consistencies in the data across multiple years with different speakers. So again, it becomes less plausible that they're just making everything up. Additionally, the number of borrowings that are in the data don't seem to be as frequent as one would expect according to Campbell's publication in 2014. So we don't see a lot of borrowings uh, from Ma or from Swahili or Datoga. We do see small amounts, but not a lot. In terms of assessing the reliability of the data, I've developed a sort of ad hoc approach that's specific to this data set. So as I said, there were five data collection sources, five independent sessions, so to speak. So what I've done is I've assigned every data piece a reliability rating based on how many times that particular lexical item was produced so that form meaning pair was produced. So if it was produced five times, it gets a rating of five. If it was four times, then it gets a rating of four. Uh, also added to that, uh, entries would get a uh, an, an added score of one to their rating if a cognate could be found in a related phrase from an independent session. So for example, if there's the phrase, you see the elephant in one session, and there's, uh, there's a production for the word elephant in another session, and the words for elephant match, then it gets a plus one. So th this means that the data with a higher rating is generally speaking more reliable. We can now see in the, the table below a breakdown of the percentage of data that received the various rankings or ratings. There were only two items that received a rating of five. 
eight items that received a rating of four, 11 items that received a rating of three, and 35 items that received a rating of two. All the rest of the items were not reproduced. So that means that it's less than 1% of the items in the data were reproduced at each session. And 85% were never reproduced. In total, if we add up the, the items for ratings two through five, we see that approximately 15 or 16% of the items were reproduced at some point. What I'm going to do now is just take you through all of the data in that 15 or 16% of productions that were repeated at least once. We're going to start with the most reliable data and work our way down. Now I checked all of these entries against a number of lexical resources from nearby languages and families, including MA uh, from RVN member Doris Payne's online dictionary of MA, Datoga from my own data and Franz Rotland's on published dictionary, Nandi uh, from Chet Kreider's dictionary, Proto Southern Nilotic from Rotland's 1982 book on the Southern Nilotic languages, Proto Eastern Nilotic from Boston's book on the subject and Proto-West Rift from Roland and Martin's work. Bonnie Sands also offered some comparative lexical data in her own no notes from other sources. What I'm going to show you now is mostly restricted to what I think is relevant to the classification of this language. It's gonna take me a few minutes to go through the data, so please bear with me. Uh, here's the first two words. These are the only two words that received a ranking of five for reliability. So we see that these two words are water and fire. In the transcriptions, we see something like vega or peca for water and marta or mata for fire. If we compare these to Datoga, Ma, Proto-Eastern Nilotic, Proto-Kalenjin, and Proto-Southern Nilotic, we'll see that the first item, water, is most likely just a borrowing from Datoga. It can be traced back to an earlier Proto-Southern Nilotic or perhaps a Proto-Nilotic root, but it most closely resembles the, the lexical item from present day Datoga. For fire, however, this item doesn't represent present day Datoga or Ma, but it looks like it could be linked potentially to uh, Proto-Kalenjin or Proto-Eastern Nilotic. In terms of proto kalenjin the reconstructed form is ma. I put the T in parentheses because most of the Kalenjin languages actually have a T or ta suffix of some kind, which would make it essentially segmentally exactly the same as some of the transcriptions that we see here. All right, moving on to items that received a reliability rating of four. The first three of these are the, uh, the word person, which was also translated as meaning who are you? the word giraffe, and the word bull. For person, we don't see any clear relationships necessarily with the other languages or families, although one could say there might be a similarity with the Proto-Southern Nilotic or proto kalenjin forms that we see here, especially if you consider some of the, uh, some of the names like Akie or Okiek, you see that, that there's some similarity there with uh, the forms like Hanakine. For giraffe, uh, we also don't see any similarities that are very striking, but in general, the, the, there's some, some, some similarities between the, the transcriptions, such as sageri or sakeri, and the forms that we see in uh, Proto-Eastern Nilotic, Ma, and then perhaps even Datoga. For bull, however, this is clearly just a borrowing from Datoga. Uh, again, this item can be linked to a Proto-Southern Nilotic root, uh, but its form most closely resembles that of present-day Datoga. Moving on to some more words with a rating of four. We have blood, head, and husband, or older man, or elder. For blood, we don't see any particular correspondence with the other languages that are listed here. For head, it appears that this is a borrowing from Ma. And for husband or older man or elder, it's a bit of a toss up. It looks like it could potentially be a borrowing from Ma. It also looks like it could be of uh, Kalenjin origin, especially if you consider 
this particular item that I've highlighted from Nandi, Boyot, meaning married man or elder. Moving on to the last group of words that received a rating of four. These are two different form meaning pairs that both have a similar meaning of mother or older woman or wife or female. Now the first of these should be quite familiar for those who, who work on languages of the Rift Valley area. So the transcription of Mayo or Amayu uh, very closely resembles a number of words that mean mother in the Rift Valley area. Uh, so if we look at Proto-Southern Nilotic, uh, you can see this is a reconstructed root Eo, meaning mother. And if you also look at Proto-West Rift, you'll see Eo. Uh, so I don't know off the top of my head, perhaps someone in the audience can, can uh, tell us afterwards in the question and answer period, uh, but I assume that this originally comes from Proto-West Rift, but if anyone knows the original source, uh, please do tell. Uh, so in terms of this particular item in Omayo, uh, it's not exactly clear where it came from or where it could have come from. Uh, it could have been just borrowed from Ma, it could have been borrowed from the Toga, or it could be related to an older Southern Nilotic source. And you may have noticed, or you may have realized, that this form actually closely resembles the name of the language, Omayo. And in fact, uh, during the last session, at the end of the very last session, I asked them about this. I said, so the name of the language is Omayo. And they said, oh, that means uh, old woman. I thought, well, okay, so what's the name of the language? And they said, oh, it's Nigueri. So I wrote down Nigueri. Now, of course, no one has gone back to confirm whether or not that's actually the name of the language. So for the time being, we'll still call it Omayo. Um, but it's possible that that's not actually the, the name of the language. For the second item, again, meaning mother or mothers, women, woman, or wife, uh, this form doesn't really appear to be related to anything else that was in this table. All right, moving on now to items with a reliability rating of three. So again, this means that they were repeated three times. We have elephant, impala, or gazelle, the dead or celebratory name for the lion, and a pot or gourd. Here we see some interesting things. So for elephant, uh, it doesn't closely resemble any lexical item from Ma or Datoga but it actually does closely resemble the proto kalenjin or proto southern Nilotic forms. Uh, so that, that I find quite interesting. For Impala and, or Gazelle, this looks like it might have just been borrowed from Ma. For the dead or celebratory uh, name for the lion, this also might have been borrowed from Ma. There's actually um, another entry for lion, which is not the dead or celebratory name, and that looks like it might be of a southern Nilotic origin. And then finally, this word for pot or gourd. Now, this one is a bit complicated. It, it, it could have just been borrowed from Ma. It could have been borrowed from the Toga. It could come from another Southern Nilotic source. It's really hard to say. And one of the reasons that it's hard to say is that there was a lot of variation in the transcriptions in terms of the initial consonant. So was it a velar or was it an alveolar? And uh, if we knew which one it was, then that would point the analysis in a, in a certain direction. Moving on to the second group of items that received a rating of three. We have a knife or small knife, son, young boy, and young girl. Knife or a small knife very closely resembles a form from Nandi, but also somewhat resembles forms from Ma and the Toga. The word for son should be fairly familiar. It again resembles forms from uh, Kalenjin, uh, also resembles the form from the Toga, does not resemble a form from Ma or Proto-Eastern Nilotic. For young boy, there's not an uh, extremely close resemblance to anything uh, except for the word Orjoga from Datoga. For young girl, there is not a close resemblance with any of the other languages or families. All right, moving on to the last group for rating three, we see leg, hand, or arm, and river. Leg, again, is an item that somewhat resembles the Datoka form, but really very closely resembles the uh, Kalenjin form or the Proto-Southern Nilotic form. Uh, potentially, it could also be said to resemble the, the Ma form. Uh, 
Uh, the word for hand or arm appears to be a borrowing from the toga, the, the word vanakta, which means palm of the hand. And the word for river, again, no, no clear similarities, but potentially could be connected with a nilotic source. Now, I'd like to show just a few of the entries that received a rating of two, uh, just because they might be insightful. So three of those are the word for eye, mouth, and eland. The word for eye does resemble the form in the toga. It also resembles the form uh, for proto eastern nilotic. I wasn't actually able to find an entry for eye in the online mod dictionary, so I will have to check on that to confirm whether or not it, it could be a borrowing from ma, because it essentially resembles everything in that row. For the word mouth, uh, again, it very closely resembles the item from the toga, but then also the lexical item from ma. So this really could have come from, from anywhere, but probably from a nilotic source. And um, looking at the protocol engine and proto southern nilotic forms, it looks likely that it came from a southern nilotic source. For the final item, Eland, uh, this item is interesting because it, it doesn't resemble the Ma or the Toga words. It, there's uh, no corresponding Proto-Southern Nilotic or Proto-Eastern Nilotic form in the publications that are referred to. But uh, there is a very, very similar form that is in Chet Kreider's Dictionary for Nandi. So this, was, uh, this really stuck out to me. Finally, I'd just like to go through some of the data on the numerals to uh, give you an idea for how complicated all of this data is. So here we see entries just for the numerals one, two, and three. For the numeral one, the, the, the form that received the highest reliability rating of two was something like uh, Kuyeshnya. And the highest, the, the, the form that got the highest rating for the numeral two was Ngager or Ngagesh. And then the highest rating for three was something like Haimo or Aimo. But you'll probably quickly notice that some of these forms actually occur as productions that were intended to mean one of the other numerals. So if we look at uh, the word, if we look at the, the entry for number three, Haimo, this received the highest reliability rating for the meaning three, you'll see that that was also used uh, at least on one occasion uh, for the meaning two, but then also for the meaning one. Uh, you'll also see that the entry that got the highest rating for the numeral one, so that first item again, Kuishnya, that also occurs uh, for one, you know, in one session for the meaning two. You can see that uh, it's the last entry from the, for the numeral two. So what we see here is that the speakers um, or perhaps uh, interchanging some of these items across different sessions. But what's also interesting about this is that we do have some level of certainty, not very much, but some level of certainty that these forms are associated with some sort of numeral semantics, even if we don't have a high level of confidence about what exact number it, it's, uh, it's referring to. And then just added to that, during uh, during my session, I, when I was trying to get uh, when I was trying to elicit noun phrases, I asked for one elephant and then two elephants. When I asked for one elephant, the speaker said "aimo." So again, that's uh, one of the the forms that's associated with the number three or the number one or even the number two. Then when I asked for two elephants, the speaker said "aimo" in Gagesh. So then that, if you look at it. It doesn't look like there's a word for elephant in there. It looks like the speaker was trying to say one, two. But again, this is, just makes things more confusing because the first item was not the one that received the highest rating for the meaning of one. Uh, however, the second one is the item that received the highest rating for the number two. So perhaps one could say this indicates that Ingagesh is more likely to mean two. Now, just some broad generalizations, very pr preliminary observations about the, the data. Uh, in terms of the phonetics and phonology, there is what I perceive to be uh, some ATR contrast. 
unfortunately, I cannot uh, play this sound file uh, because of an issue with my computer in Zoom. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, well, I would put it in the chat box, but I closed it. All right, I will, I will give you the links after I'm done with the presentation. Anyway, suffice it to say that um, this is an example word which I perceived to have a minus AKR eval at the end of it, so something like huanyesho. And then this next item is something like kuusho, so somewhat more of a plus ATR eval quality. In terms of the consonant inventory, it looks somewhat nilotic like. Uh, so we see that um, there's a, a, a labialized velar series, also a, a potentially labialized uh, bilabial nasal. Uh, we do see some uh, potentially pre nasalized stops, which aren't necessarily associated with nilotic uh, consonant inventories, but do occur in some nilotic languages. The rhotic uh, was definitely very often trilled, and that would be expected uh, coming from a, a speaker of Ma. In terms of the syllable structure, in some cases, uh, especially in the, the, the data that can't be linked to uh, an analytic source, there seems to be uh, somewhat of a preference for CV uh, syllables. But uh, not always, there are a lot of examples of CVC syllables as well. One other interesting feature which I just wanted to share uh, is that the speakers, when they would talk in Swahili, uh, they would devoice their fricatives. So this is actually a feature that's associated with the languages of the Rift Valley area. In the original publication about the Rift Valley area, it wasn't associated with Swahili because in standard Swahili, you voice the fricatives. But in some of these regional varieties of Swahili, speakers will actually devoice their fricatives. So I thought this was interesting because the, uh, Macau, the area where the speakers are, is a little bit on the periphery of the Rift Valley area. Um, and also these, these speakers are also speaking Ma. So it's interesting to see that one of those features of the area is being utilized here. And again, I'll share a link to this file once we're done with the presentation. In terms of the morphology and syntax, there's really not too much we can say at this point. Uh, as you may have noticed, there's some evidence of southern nilotic nominal suffixes. So we have a, a number of words with a, a T or a ta, meaning singular, and a number of other words with a K or a ka or ga, meaning plural. And uh, in the particular case of water, that's just the it's just the way that uh, that word has been lexicalized is that it's in the plural. Uh, that's how it is in Datoga as well. Uh, there isn't really any clear evidence of verbal morphology. There's no consistencies in, in the verbal data. There is, however, some evidence of possible VO constituent order and prodrop. So if we look at these few examples, such as I see the cattle, and then the word for cattle, you look at the giraffe, and the word for giraffe, and start a fire, and the word for fire, you'll see that the verb in those phrases always precedes the object. So to sum up, we have some clear evidence of contact with Ma and the Toga speakers. That's to be expected because they live in an area where the Ma, Maasai and the Toga also live. There also appears to be some evidence of either Southern Nilotic origin or old contact with Southern Nilotic speakers. So this evidence includes a very small set of lexical items. So the words for fire, elephant, eland, eye, mouth, and leg. Uh, also the nominal morphology that I just mentioned. And then also the fact that all of the other entries, which can't be linked specifically to Southern Nilotic, are from some sort of ambiguous Nilotic source, or likely from a, or likely recent borrowing, or can't be linked to any particular family or language. Also, although the vast majority of the data cannot be connected to any language or family, the inconsistencies in that data prevent us from confidently saying that it's a language isolate. So if we saw a, a lot of data that was repeated many times that had no connection with any other language or family in the region, then we could plausibly say this looks like a language isolate, but that's not actually the case. 
terms of future directions, uh, it's possible that one of us, either myself or perhaps Andrew or, or anyone, could go to visit Macau to get more data. Uh, if, if the pandemic subsides, then hopefully that would happen sometime within the next year. As I said, the speakers are quite old. I plan to do some more thorough analysis of the entries with a reliability rating of one. As, as I indicated, there are very many entries with a reliability rating of one, so checking those against all of those lexical resources takes a lot of time, uh, but I'd like to do that a little bit more. I'd also like to uh, do some phonetic and phonotactic analysis uh, and continue to look for more possible connections with Southern Nanlot. So again, I'd just like to share the Omayo Language Resources Project, which is hosted on OSF. Uh, please check that out. You can leave a comment on OSF. Uh, if you'd like to participate in curating the data, uh, let me know. I'm happy to collaborate with anyone who's interested. Also, in the process of, uh, of analyzing this data, I created a, a couple of small resources based on uh, Vasan and, and Rotland's uh, reconstructions, I see there's a mistake here, of Proto-Eastern Nilotic and Proto-Southern Nilotic reconstructions. So those are uh, hosted on GitHub. Again, those are fairly short lists, but can be useful for anyone who's trying to look up for potential cognates in either of these families. I want to thank you for listening to my talk. Also, I want to mention a number of organizations that have contributed to this presentation, including the Endangered Languages Documentation Program, the University of Oregon, the Firebird Foundation, and Leiden University. If you have any questions about this presentation, I look forward to, uh, to engaging with you in the Q&A section, and you can also send me an email at the address that you see on your screen, and I will get back to you soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard, for your very interesting presentation. So if anyone has a question or comments, uh, please leave them in the Zoom chat module. Uh, and just so everyone has some time to write, I'm going to start with a question of my own. Um, I was wondering, uh, for the, the words that you found, which have possibly cognates in the, uh, one of the proto-languages, so perhaps one of the proto nilotic ones, do you see any consistency in, for example, what in cross nilotic would be a K, but in Omaya would be an H? Like, do you have any consistent phonological changes there? Right, well, so I think you mentioned that one that sort of already sticks out. I, I, haven't, I haven't really looked for uh, correspondence sets, but um, that was one that stuck out to me. And another thing to keep in mind here is because of language attrition and also just the fact that these speakers are very old, uh, there are going to be some changes to the way that they produce sounds. And uh, on a number of occasions, uh, we observed that the production of some stops uh, started to change a little bit. Uh, so they might become uh, fricatives or affricates. So in the case of the K and the H, I think we did see examples of that. Perhaps I could. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Um, I will move on to a question from uh, Harald. He's asking, uh, what social linguistic information do the free speakers give of themselves? Yeah, that's a good question. Unfortunately, we really don't have much social linguistic information about them. Uh, so I asked about their past and they said they didn't really know much about it. Um, they said they used to live in the Serengeti, essentially everything I already said in the presentation. Um, so outside of that, I. I really don't have any any other information. Um, there might be something else that is in Dowdy Peterson's notes from the 2014 session, um, but that's as far as I know. That's essentially all the information that we have is that they claim to have been hunter gatherers. They claim to have resided in the Serengeti and to have been exiled at the same time as the Maasai, and then to have assimilated into the Maasai and to have possibly interacted with the Hadza at some point. Thank you. I'll move on to read out some of the comments which I see popping up. Um, so first of all from Martin Maus, he says that giraffe, sakri, is guinea fowl in Iraq, um, and elephants, mbuzu, bantu. And he goes on to say in Asax, uh, remembers the semantics of animals was wildly diverging like your numerals. 
thanks. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, yeah, the word for giraffe, yeah, it seemed like it could be linked to a number of things. Um, in terms of Asak remembers um, the semantics of animals diverging wildly, like the numerals. Yeah, I think that's to be expected um, in, in a situation like this language attrition. Um, Harold has another comment, which is there is a match between Serengeti and Dorobo of Bauman of 1894, uh, Kina Veta as in bovine matches Kina Veta for cattle in Omayo. Right, and you know, I noticed that uh, you even put it on the screen. And I didn't want to mention it because I didn't, you know, I, I saw that today. I didn't really want to say anything about it because I didn't want to rush any conclusions. But yes, that of course is quite interesting because this is a source from a long time ago and that one particular word does seem to match. None of the numerals seem to match. I haven't looked at the short text that much yet, but um, that particular word does seem to match. And Christian has a question. He says some variants of the two uh, rating five items have ndai, ndai. Are there any, do you have any thoughts of what that string might be? Yes, uh, so that's, that's a good observation. So one thing that I didn't mention is that both the female speaker and then also the male speakers, they seem to be utilizing some sort of proclitic copular construction or something like that both with nouns and then also with verbs or what uh, were produced for nouns and verbs in the English translations. So for the male speakers, there's something like ndahe or nda. And for the female speaker, the female speaker, there was something like uh, nga or ngai. Uh, I have a comment from Sarah who says, um, giraffe is sekere diktik in Hamar, South Amazic. Asach uh, has uh, Shigaro for dictic among the various recorded forms. Interesting, yeah, and I did, um, so maybe I didn't mention that here, but I, I was looking at Proto West Rift, I, I didn't look at South Amotic, but um, yeah, I didn't see enough uh, commonalities there to really look into it uh, uh, quite closely. Um, but yeah, a, a few things have popped up and uh, these, these examples are quite interesting and something to follow up on. And there is a question from Amani. He says, Macau is at the heart of the Sukuma land in the Meatu district in Tanzania. Do speakers use Sukuma language? Um, when I asked them, they didn't, they didn't mention speaking Sukuma. No, I didn't follow up on that, but um, as far as I could tell, at least the female speaker wasn't actually residing in Macau, but was residing in the Ngorongoro Conservation Area. And if the residents of Ngorongoro Conservation Area are following the rules, then there shouldn't be any Sukuma there, or people who identify as Sukuma. It should be uh, Maasai and perhaps some Hadzabe. Um, but no, I, I didn't specifically ask them if they speak Sukuma. And that's an interesting idea. That wasn't something that I thought of. And yeah, I think that would be somewhat revealing if they reside in an area where there are Sukuma speakers, but they don't speak any Sukuma. He also asked the words Mayo or Mayo Mayu is common in Bantu languages, referring to feminine descent or mater, uh, maternal descent. Therefore, language could also be called mother, if that's a possibility. Yes, that is a possibility. Perhaps one thing I didn't say is that even if the, the word for mother is Omayo and the name of the language is Omayo, that doesn't rule out the possibility that they are one and the same, that the, the name of the language could be mother. Yes, that is a possibility. And on the subject of mother, Martin asks, it's ma io for mother. Do you see ma as a petrified prefix? I haven't seen that in the rest of the data. Uh, you, you're welcome to check, but no, I haven't seen anything that looks like a, a productive ma prefix. Uh, then Amani has another comment, which is mburi mburi means goats in some Bantu languages. Uh, in Parecha, Su language in Kilimanjaro, it mburi mburi means goat. Right, so this is for the item that I believe was produced for the translation of uh, uh, elephant. 
So, yeah, I think that's something that might have popped up on my radar, but because of the difference in semantics, I didn't really consider it. Um, also because it was one of those items that uh, was, was repeated multiple times. Uh, now we could also go back and check the productions for uh, the translation of, of GOAT um, and see if there's any similarities there. But in general, I have seen almost nothing in terms of Bantu-like lexical items. There's just not much there. And Andrew has a comment. He says regarding Christian comments on the Dai or Ndai, uh, it seems very Bantu, um, like Dio in Swahili. Uh, this form is often used to mean it is or as a, some sort of focus marker in some of the Bantu languages of the area. Right, and that's sort of a, a perfectly timed comment because uh, that uh, speaks to what I just said, which is this is the one thing that actually stuck out to me as being very Bantu-like which was uh, this prefix or prochotic, this copular construction of ndai or ngai. I haven't seen anything like that in the Nilotic languages that I'm familiar with, but yeah, of course it, it does look like something Bantu-like. And Andrew also asked, what would be the first thing you would do if and when you get back to Macau, elicitation-wise or regarding future research? Well, certainly trying to get a larger volume of data uh, would, would help us out significantly. Uh, trying to get uh, a lot more sociolinguistic information, as Harold was saying. Um, also, just being able to sit down with them for some period of time. So as far as I know, every time someone's gone to work with them, they're traveling from somewhere else. They visit them for maybe a day, and then they leave. And oh, we. Uh, sorry, I saw a comment from Martin, we'll just that in a second. Um, so it would be nice to actually spend some more time with them, to get to know them a, a little bit more deeply and to establish a more positive uh, mutual relationship with them um, so that then we could really dive a little bit deeper into this phenomenon because it is really interesting and I, I, I think it would be of benefit to them as well to to learn more about uh, their their own ethnic origins. And um, that's something that I would like to do. So to spend a, a longer period of time working with them, collecting more data, um, collecting more diverse data, and um, getting that sociolinguistic. Yeah, so Marta offers to come and get names. Yeah, so we actually have their names. Um, I didn't mention that in the presentation if you go to the OSF website, uh, they're the Ohio Language Resources Project. Uh, their names are listed there. And I have a comment from Amani. He says, I don't see any problem with the counting system because African languages do not consist, uh, constitute uh, a one-to-one -one pairing. In some Bantu languages, addition or subtraction uh, may mean a different number. For example, one and two can have a name, but three can be a name of one plus name of one. This is highly used for numbers above 10. Uh, Abel Moreta and Stefan Lukusa have short papers on numeral systems in Bantu. Yes, that's cer certainly a possibility. Um, what to us may seem like random variation could actually be systematic in a way that we just don't understand. Um, and as I said, th this there's something, something about the consistency in that variation, just looking at the numerals that seems significant in some way. Um, so yeah, there, there could be something going on there. And there's another question from Harold. He asked, how did Daudi discover uh, the language by chance or by systematically looking for the local people? I'm not exactly sure. So that's something uh, I could ask Daudi uh, when I communicate with him the next time. My impression is that it's most likely that he was in contact with Mwiba Lodge for a variety of different reasons. Uh, he was also, he's been visiting that area for some time because there are Hadza who live there. Um, so he, he must have been visiting there from time to time. Uh, so he could have either heard about them while he was visiting or he could have heard about them from the Mwiba Lodge, which is located there. Um, that's my guess. 
Yeah, so I have another question from Harold. He says, is it likely that uh, if one travels through Moss Island, that there could be uh, any number of durable grandmothers and fathers? Uh, yes, well, I'll interpret this as meaning durable in the sense from various different durable communities. Uh, yeah, that is the case. So I actually had additional slides about other durable communities in Tanzania. So if, let's see if we go back to my page with a, a map on it. So I was going to talk about the Okiek, Nyake, as well as Asak and Nyaku. So um, the Asak uh, have claimed at some point in the past that uh, there were other speakers of that language even in the Serengeti. Um, they also, uh, it's been written that they might have uh, come to Tanzania before the Maasai or they might have come with the Maasai. Um, also, if you just look at the distance between the Okiek and the Akie, so these are two very closely related groups and some like Martin would say they're the same essentially linguistically. Uh, they traveled a very far distance in a relatively short period of time when we're looking at linguistic history. So the possibility of there being other groups, especially other Southern Nilotic um, or Cushitic groups um, in this area, uh, or in any area where there are Maasai, yes, that, that's definitely very possible. And so I'm sure if you were traveling through the Angora Angora Conservation Area and you just went around asking for Dorobo, you could probably find some people almost anywhere that you went. Now whether or not uh, they still speak um, a Dorobo language, um, it's hard to say. Um, I mean, it really varies you know, on a case-to-case -case basis. Another question from Amani. He says, when I was in Sungu village near Macau this year, I heard the name Dorobo and Dorobo as hunters and gatherers. Will you treat them as close to Hatsa? Yeah, so that's a good question. So the term Dorobo is often used to refer to hunters and gatherers, but also from somewhat of a, a, a particular perspective. And that's usually from the perspective of a larger ethnic group, especially the Maasai, but also Kalenjin or Kikuyu. So uh, in this particular case, the Hadza are sometimes referred to as the Robo. And even Dowdy Peterson himself, he created a company called the Robo Safaris, and he primarily works with the Hadza. Um, I don't believe that the Hadza themselves identify as the Robo and would never call themselves the Robo. But the speakers of Omayo, uh, when you talk with them, they most often re refer to their language as Kidorobo, as the Robo language. Uh, so I wouldn't necessarily treat them as the same thing or, or uh, as being that similar to the Hadza. We also don't really have that much information about any sort of relationship between the speakers of Omayo and the speakers of Hadza. Um, so they seem to be relatively distinct things and to have uh, very different relationships uh, with these other communities in the area. So the the Omayo have more or less totally assimilated into the Maasai community, whereas the Hadza, um, in some areas at least, remain still very culturally distinct. He has a follow-up question. Uh, he says, Bernd Heine, Karsten Legere, and Christa Koning have produced a book on Akia. They are also called the Robo. Is there any similarity between Akia and Omayo? Thanks, that's a good question too. And I, I have looked at that book. Unfortunately, they don't have uh, a lexicon or a word list or a dictionary or anything that I'm aware of. Uh, so it was a little bit challenging for me to look for potential cognates in Akie, but that's something that I'm definitely interested in. Um, based on the data that I've looked at, there are actually more similarities with Nandi than with Akie. Uh, but again, I was just scrolling through some texts in that book by Heine with Sharon Krennic. Uh, so it was a bit challenging to look for any particular lexical items to compare. But I think we're done for today. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, uh, of course, you researched for this very interesting talk and everyone else for the questions and comments. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that recordings of all of the presentations in the Rift Valley webinar series can be found uh, on the Rift Valley Network YouTube page and entries for each presentation are added to the Rift Valley bibliography. Looking ahead, the next presentation in the webinar series will be given on Wednesday, June 3rd by Sarah Petrolino. 
and it's titled Investigation of Appearance in Hamar, Methodological Challenges and Plenary Results. I would like to thank Richard again for his presentation and of course everyone else for participating today and I hope to see you again at our next webinar.